Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thanks, Fran. Hi, everybody. My name is Lois, an alcoholic. And I'm a member of the Greenwich Village group in New York City, and it's probably the most off-the-wall group in the entire fellowship, <laughs> but solid. Um, I, like a lot of other speakers, as mentioned or several, was very excited when Marie called me and invited me to Hilton Head to share in the Midwinter Conference. And in fact, I was so in- excited that Thursday after work I went out and bought myself a new frock for the occasion and then spent the entire weekend worrying about whether I'd be able to get into it this morning because it just fit on Thursday and I mean just fit and um, I feel like a floozy because it doesn't just fit this morning and So that's what it's like to be the Sunday morning speaker at an event like this when you have ice cream bars two nights in a row and and uh, seafood buffets. Being the Sunday morning speaker is, is difficult for me. I get invited to go to quite a few things because of working at the general service office, not because I have a fantastic story. And And when I'm the Sunday morning speaker, that means my anxiety builds all weekend long. And on this trip, it started building Friday afternoon when Hazel and and Terry picked me up in Savannah and spent, oh, a good ten minutes telling me how tremendous Sister Pat was as the Sunday morning speaker last year. And I've been in the fellowship a long time, and I know it's not a competition, and I know we're not out to get any prizes But I still have a lot of human failings. So that's, you know, and I know about turning it over and letting go and and all of that kind of thing, but still the anxiety builds. And then the fact that all the speakers have been tremendous so far hasn't helped either because it kind of builds up to a fever pitch. But anyway, I am very happy to be here in spite of all that. And I, I do thank Marie and the committee so very much because it's just been a delightful weekend, and, and a member of the committee asked me yesterday if I could think of any ways to improve upon this, and I, I'm telling you, I just can't, it, except maybe the weather. <laughs> I also brought a little warm-up suit and felt like an absolute fool carrying my tennis racket into the hotel Friday afternoon. I had left my down coat at, in New York and wish I had brought it yesterday, but it is so good to be here, and I do thank you. Um You know, customarily, the Sunday morning talks usually are sort of of a spiritual nature. And um, I I went to the South Florida Roundup Labor Day weekend down at West Palm Beach. And since it was Labor Day, the weekend was a three-day event. So the wind-up talk, which I was invited to give, was on Monday morning rather than Sunday morning. So they called it the the one-for-the-road talk. (laughs) And that seemed a little bit more like me. Particularly when I think when I joined AA, I uh, I was such an arrogant, um, non-spiritual person. I was I was really an agnostic, and and possibly would have defined myself as an atheist, except that I just wasn't sure. I mean, I wasn't that positive, but I, I certainly wasn't a believer. And the idea that AA is a spiritual program just totally turned me off. And I didn't make any bones about that. I let a lot of people know it. And then someone told me about the guy in AA who hadn't believed in God and got tired of hearing all that God stuff. And one night he was expounding at his meeting and he said, you know, you people talk about God, but I know from personal experience that there is no God. He said, you know, I was, I'm a pilot and I was up flying in the Arctic region and I developed engine trouble, and and that motor started sputtering, and I said, oh, please, God, do something to keep this plane from crashing. He said, but I went down, and he said, I was just lucky and made a crash landing on a big field of ice. And so there I was in the middle of this frozen wasteland, and I said, oh, please, God, get me out of this alive. 
And members of the group said, well, you're here, aren't you? And he said, yeah, but God didn't have anything to do with it. A bunch of Eskimos came along. <laughs> and, you know, there have been so many Eskimos in my AA life, and that's what I would like to talk about a little bit this morning. And I think there were a lot of Eskimos in my life before I came to AA, too, but I just, just simply couldn't recognize them. Before I get into my story, I do want to remember to say, too, that although I work at the General Service Office, I'm not here as a spokesman from the office and certainly not as a spokesman for AA because there just aren't any spokesmen for the fellowship. So I'm sharing my story, my experience, uh, strength, and hope, and, and probably because I'm me, I'll share some of my opinions and ideas, too, but, but they're mine. And uh, as I said, please you don't like what I'm saying, uh, it's not the office line. It's, it, it's my story this morning. I, my story begins very early, really. I don't even remember my first drink. Both my parents were alcoholic. And in our family album, there's a picture of, of the three of us before my sister was born. I was about two and a half years old, maybe three. And I was standing between my dad and my mother. My dad was a tall, slender, good-looking guy, and my mother was uh, a very pretty brunette who kind of looked like Judy Garland in her younger days. And, and they were very young when I was born. So the three of us were standing there, each of us with a bottle of Coors tilted to our mouths. And, and my bottle may have been empty. It may have been a prop. I don't remember. But it's a cute picture. But it has a sad ending because my dad died of cirrhosis about 25 years later. He was 54 when he died. And my mother has cirrhosis and is, uh, today I think she's sober, but it's an on again, off again thing with her. And my sister, who hadn't been born yet, is also an alcoholic with a, a terrific pill problem. And, and she has been into AA for a little while and back out. So out of the four nuclear family, or, or the nucleus, I don't know which it is. Anyway, out of our family of four, I'm the only one who, in a sense, is making it. And, and if I have a message, it's that I'm making it because I was the only one of the four of us who was willing to go to AA and do anything, even when I didn't like what I was told to do, even when I thought it was ridiculous, uh, for some reason, I hung in. I don't know why. Uh, maybe I was more desperate, except my dad died of it, and that's getting pretty desperate. Uh, I, I really don't know why, but I feel very, very grateful for that, and I haven't given up hope on my mother or my sister. Anyway, I, when I was listening to Fran yesterday morning, I identified an awful lot with the various stages she was describing when she was talking about the family of the alcoholic, because... I went into my managing stage, uh, managing the family affairs when I was, I don't know, around eight or nine years old, I would say. And by the time I was in high school, I was the pillar of strength in the family. And I can remember, I went to high school in Columbus, Georgia, incidentally. And I can remember kids in high school coming up and saying, Lois, how come you never smile? You just always look so serious about everything. And it was about that time that I started having a... Uh, little experimental drinks with friends. Now, I had grown up getting sips of beer or little half glasses of beer at home. So as I said, I don't even remember my first drink, but I remember my first so-called social drinking experiences with friends. And it was just curiosity, really. Somebody would get some liquor from their parents' liquor cabinet, and we'd try it out and taste a lot of different things or whatever. But I always seemed to get the drunkest of the crowd. Uh, you know, we'd all get silly and giddy, but I would get just downright drunk and sick, and yet I'd do it again the next time I had a chance. And the first time I ever really heard anything about AA, and as I look back, I'm amazed by this, it was at Columbus High School in the early 1950s, and two members of AA, two men, came to our high school assembly. Now, I can hardly believe that they were well enough organized in those days to even have public information committees, but apparently they did because I'm sure those two people were invited by somebody. 
And of all the high school assemblies I attended in four years, the one I remember the best is the one where those two AA members stood up in the auditorium and identified themselves as alcoholics. And I just couldn't believe it because that word wasn't in my vocabulary yet. I just knew my folks had an awful lot of trouble with drinking. And one of the things, first of all, I was impressed that they looked so nice. Secondly, I was impressed that they would admit they were alcoholics in front of all these people. And then uh, thirdly, I was impressed that they didn't seem to be having any trouble anymore as far as drinking goes. But one thing that really stood out in my mind was that they said that one out of 15 of us in that audience would become alcoholic someday. Now, I think the statistic has has gone down since then to something like one out of ten. And I remember, and I had just had a few real drinking experiences, thinking, you know, with my luck, I'm going to be one of those 15. And, you know, it was already there. I had already had my first blackout at age 15. Uh, it had only lasted a couple of hours, but there had been a, a dark period one night when I just didn't remember what had happened and I hadn't passed out. People told me I was just hilarious during that period. Now, I um, believe me, had I known when I was drinking that one day I'd be working at GSO and would be invited to tell my story, I would have worked a lot harder at having a story with more punch. Um, but my story is my story, and really it's the story of a progressive illness, uh, of getting sicker, but not just overnight, of going downhill and then leveling off for a while so that I could delude myself into thinking, gee, everything's just fine, I don't have a problem after all, and then down a couple of more notches and then pulling myself together again so that I could deny. And, you know, denial is, is what we're just past masters. Uh, I was with my dad when he died of cirrhosis, and he was lying in his bed in restraint, as yellow as this tablecloth, and he said, you know, when I get out of this hospital, all I want to do is sit in my chair and have a little glass of wine. And I said, but Daddy, that wine is what's made you so sick. You can't have a little glass of wine when you go home. And he said, oh, no, it's not. He said, I just have a little heart condition. So talk about denial, and he died about three hours later. Um, <clears throat> anyhow, I kept kidding myself that I was okay because I had a good job. I was a teacher. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go through the blow-by-blow -blow party school drinking days in college and so forth. But, you know, on the surface, I really did everything just fine. I finished college, not with honors exactly, but not bad. Uh, you know, my, my partying was mostly weekend sorority fraternity party drinking that I thought everybody was doing. And I went out to San Francisco and started teaching school. I got drunk the night before school started, and it was all out of anxiety and fear. You think that kids are afraid of the teacher, and believe me, a lot of teachers are afraid of the kids. And I was. I was afraid they wouldn't like me. I was afraid the teachers wouldn't like me. I was afraid the parents wouldn't like me and that I wouldn't be able to do the job. So I had tremendous feelings of inadequacy, although on the surface I could accomplish things. So I started my first day of school with a hangover, and I repeated that pattern every single year that I taught until I quit drinking. Uh, you know, I, I uh, after a few years, got wise and just sort of laid it out for the kids on the first day. I taught elementary, usually fourth or fifth grade, and I told them, Miss Fisher has good days and Miss Fisher has bad days. And on the good days, we'll do all kinds of fun things. We'll, we'll uh, make up plays. We'll do murals. We'll do, you know, science projects. We'll do, you know, just all sorts of things. And, and on the bad days, there would be long lists of things for them to do that would keep them quiet. And I uh, wasn't very happy with where I was, you know, this people, places, and things we talk about, I, I decided that San Francisco was just too much of a big city for me, and everybody was too sophisticated, and I didn't fit in. I had never felt that I fit in anywhere. So I um, moved up to Reno to be near Lake Tahoe so I could be a real outdoors type, you know, all-American girl and ski and, 
and uh, take hikes and all of that. And in Reno, of course, the places stay open 24 hours a day. And I didn't spend very many weekends skiing, I might add. And I wasn't happy in Reno either. And then I got a job teaching in Europe for the Army, and I thought, that's it. You know, I'll explore museums and art galleries, and what my life needs is a little culture. And I'll study German, only I never got to German class because happy hour at the officers' club was the you know, before the German class, and I never left. But I didn't know that the first drink set up a compulsion and that I just had to keep going. So I, I um, <clears throat> left um, Germany and came back to the States and went back to Lake Tahoe, and, oh, I dealt blackjack in the summer times, and I got rolled one night. Uh, that's not very ladylike, and, you know, I... I uh, had worked a swing shift and got off, and we got tips. And, and, you know, I always have felt like I led sort of a double life. You know, there was the prim, proper school teacher on the one hand and the dark blackjack dealer on the other hand. <laughs> but I, uh, a lot of teachers, believe it or not, deal blackjack at Lake Tahoe in the summertime. But one night I got off, and I went to the table, and I was on a lucky streak, and I was just raking it in and, and they kept bringing me free drinks, and I kept drinking them and breaking in the money. And finally, a kid next to me who looked like Joe Ivy League said, gee, you really should cash out. You've cleaned out the, the $25 check tube. I had over $1,000 in chips in front of me. And, and I said, you know, I think you're right. And so I cashed out and got 10 $100 bills and some change. By that time, it was broad daylight, and I offered to buy this kid a drink and that's about the last thing I remember very clearly for a while and then he asked me if he could have a ride down the road and I gave him a ride down the road and then he said to ask me to drop him off and I dropped him off and when I got home I opened my little clutch purse to count my money and there was no money in there and I had been rolled and um, so I, I didn't like these things going on in my life, but I kept putting them down. I felt dirty. I, I, um, I didn't understand it either because it certainly isn't what I had had in mind for myself. And I ended up back in San Francisco in my late 20s, having kind of done the geographics and finding out that they didn't work. And I hung around with a very, very heavy drinking crowd, and that made my drinking not look so bad, of course. And I was still working. You know, I, I had a criteria in front of me, and it was as long as I'm getting up and going to work in the morning, I can't really be an alcoholic. And I even started graduate school. Uh, you know, as, as long as if I'm going to graduate school, I can't be alcoholic. And I was active in the teachers' association, you know. Uh, I was the pillar of the community by, by day and a lush by night. And, and I didn't know about unmanageability and lack of control because for some reason I still seem to be able to some degree to control the starting time as far as my drinking goes. Um, I was learning that if I wanted to get to the Spanish class I was taking, I had better not stop for a beer after school before the class because I wouldn't get there. But I still didn't have it all together. And a friend of mine, in fact, my best drinking friend in San Francisco, joined AA. And it was really a blow to me because she was she didn't drink nearly as much as I did, and I had never seen her stagger. I was a staggering, falling down drunk. You know, I fell off bar stools. I lost my car many times. I woke up in strange places sometimes. Um, and, and Lynn always seemed able to walk a straight line and, as I said, didn't drink as much as I did. So when she joined AA, that really kind of threw me for a loop. And of course, I didn't think she was alcoholic. If she was an alcoholic, what did that make me? And I, uh, by this time, was very, very concerned about my mother's drinking, much more concerned about her drinking than my drinking. So I started visiting some AA meetings with Lynn. Now, ostensibly, this was to give Lynn support and to find out about AA for my mother. And, and you people were wonderful because nobody came up to me 
and said, honey, you look like you could use it too. And I did. And I never went to a meeting sober. I wasn't drunk, but I had always had a couple of drinks because the meetings didn't start until 8.30. And, you know, those drinks were just enough to give me a negative, cynical edge. And I would walk in. And rather than be impressed by the laughter I heard or the friendliness that I I saw around me, I thought, you phony, phony people, you are trying so hard to act like you're having a good time to convince yourself that you really like it this way. And I honestly, in my heart of hearts, believed you'd give an arm and a leg to have had the martini I had a few hours before. And the thing is, I didn't know that you had a choice at that time, and I didn't. And uh, and I, I did go to a few meetings, and I remember well the first meeting I went to as a visitor. And I looked for every way that I could to deny my illness. And I heard the man talk about blackouts that lasted two weeks, and I thought, oh, thank God, mine just lasted a few hours. And then he talked about waking up in strange cities. And I said, well, I wake up in strange beds now and then, but I always stay in town. And um, then he said, then he said, there may be some of you out there who aren't identifying with me because these things haven't happened to you. And he said, all I can tell you is if you're an alcoholic, just keep drinking and they will happen. And I thought, well, you so-and-so, just because you can't drink, you want to make all the rest of us miserable and scared. And uh, uh, Misery loves company. So that was my attitude. A few months later, I totaled the car and multiple fractures. Thank God I didn't hurt anyone else. And that was kind of a message. It was hard for me, even me, to deny that I was drunk that night because I didn't remember getting in the car. I didn't remember trying to drive home. And there used to be a a light post on the James Lick Freeway in San Francisco that isn't there anymore. Um, Anyhow, I was getting the message. And the following December, which was 1970, I I did come to AA. Now, I didn't lose a job. I didn't lose a family, but I'd never been able to have a relationship last long enough to get married. (laughs) And in all honesty... One of the reasons I'm not married is that the three men that I would like to have married at one point in my life didn't want to marry me. (laughs) And and it's as simple as that, really. And and I think some of the reason they didn't want to marry me was that I just drank too much for them. And some of the reason I was attracted to them, I think, is that the healthy, healthy part of me did not want to marry somebody who drank like I drank, because that would have met a marriage like my parents had had, which was bad news. Anyway, I um, <clears throat> I got sidetracked on that. I, I um, did start going to AA, and it was just simply a matter of having lost all self-esteem, all self-respect, all self-confidence, most of my friends, and just thoroughly hating myself. Uh, I I uh, would get up in the morning and look in the mirror and I'd see this bloated face and dirty hair and bloodshot eyes and I I didn't drink in the morning before school but I would pour water and coke down trying to kill the thirst and visine in my eyes and the committee so nicely asked us not to use profanity up here and I and it was such a gentle way that they did it but but my message to myself in the morning was you're a blankety blank drunk just like your mother, and I hated myself for it, hated it, because I had hated her drinking. For some reason, I hated mother's drinking more than daddy's drinking. I guess that's that old double standard, but it it really had bothered me. So I did go to AA on the 17th of December, 1970, and I raised my hand out there. They asked new people to raise their hands and identify themselves. And I raised my hand and said, my name's Lois, and I'm an alcoholic, and I could hardly believe the words had come out of my mouth. Uh, because I hadn't planned. You just had to say who you were. You didn't have to say you were an alcoholic. And, uh, and you know, it hadn't been my goal in life to join AA at all. And I had had a lot better things in mind for myself, I thought. But it was a feeling of having made a turnaround that night For the first time in my life, I felt comfortable in the room, and that kind of bothered me because I thought, wouldn't you know, I feel comfortable with a bunch of losers in life. 
And, and that was my cynical, arrogant attitude. But I felt at home, I felt welcome, and I did feel like maybe finally I'm going in the right direction in life. And I got, I loved the fellowship. I didn't like the idea that AA is spiritual, but I loved the fellowship uh, aspect. And, and I did hang around with the winners in AA, and I did get a sponsor, and I did go to lots of meetings. I, I got active in just about every way possible that you could see. I mean, I'd go to any lengths to make a 12-step call. I'd take the teleservice at intergroup on weekends. But you all heard about it all the time. I, uh, you know, made coffee at the meeting at, in the detox unit. But I didn't make any changes inside. And so my sobriety, my first two years, was peaks and valleys all the time. I either was kind of manic and on top of the world, or I was way down here. And the valleys lasted longer than the peaks did, I might add. And I wasn't enjoying life much, and I kind of wore sobriety like a straight jacket and concentrated more on what I couldn't do than what I could do. And as I said, the steps, I certainly heard about the steps and, and uh, knew about the steps, but I didn't do anything about the steps. And I uh, was speaking at, at a big meeting in San Francisco after I had been sober about a year and a half, and I remember very clearly sitting up on the dais telling myself, you've come a long way, baby. You've only been in the program a year and a half, and you're already speaking at this big meeting. And I wasn't giving any credit to God, of course, because I didn't believe in God. No credit to any people in AA who had put up with me and tolerated me and, and tried to steer me in the right direction. It was just all me. And it wasn't long after that that I was drunk again, and nobody was surprised but me. <laughs> I uh, had come so far and was doing so well that I started doubting that I was really an alcoholic. You know, I started thinking I may be a little teensy tiny bit alcoholic, but not as alcoholic as the rest of you. So I didn't go to as many meetings, and I started hanging around with old drinking friends, and I decided that it was okay for me to smoke pot socially because alcohol had been my problem, not marijuana. And um, I, I was still going to meetings now and then, but feeling a little hypocritical because the people I was hanging out with in AA really thought sobriety meant doing it in the natch without funny cigarettes or anything else to make you feel good except how you work the program and what you're doing with your life. And one night I got very angry about something that is so insignificant I can't even remember what it was, but I picked up a drink. And I was just going to have a couple of drinks. Obviously I didn't believe I uh, was an alcoholic because I would have known I couldn't just have a couple of drinks if I had believed that. And I ended up driving to the Golden Gate Bridge and I was going to jump off. And oh, it was an awful night. I can say 11 more than 11 years later that for me it was a real good thing but I sure don't advocate it for anybody because what it did for me was was erase all shadow of a doubt that I was alcoholic and I um, I had an Eskimo in my life that night and I, and I just have to share this sometimes people in my group say they just won't talk to anybody about AA if they're drinking and that always bothers me because I got in my car that night and drove across that, went over to the bridge and then drove across and went to see an AA friend in Tiburon. And it was after midnight and I pounded on her door and she came and we had never known each other drinking. We had met in the fellowship. And when she opened the door, she naturally was in bed. When she opened the door, I said, Frankie, I've been drinking. And honest to God, if she had shut the door or said, Lois, go away, and when you're not drinking, I'll talk to you. I don't know what I would have done that night, but in the state I was in, I, I really think I may have gone back to that bridge and jumped. But instead, she said, oh, Lois, come in, and she put her arms around me, and, and she talked to me, and I can't remember word for word what she said that night because I was drunk, but I do remember the feeling of love I felt. And then, and I was, I woke up there the next morning and she talked to me some more. 
and and uh, I'll be grateful to her until the day I die. I got back to a meeting that night, and I <laughs> realized that I had to change my ways in AA, and and uh, I didn't look at those first two years because I had been sober almost two years when I did that or dry. I didn't look at them as lost time in any sense, but I realized that I had to do things a lot differently. And um, one of the things I realized is that that I had to have a commitment to AA, but it couldn't be a showy commitment. It couldn't be the kind of thing where people would come up and pat me on the back because my ego just couldn't take it. And after I had been back a few months, a fellow I knew who was very active in, in service work got me involved in that, and it was the last thing I wanted to do. I didn't give a darn about GSRs and DCMs and GSOs. In fact, to to diverse a minute, I don't think most of us when we come into AA care about those things, and I don't think that's surprising. I think we come into the fellowship very concerned about ourselves and our own recovery from alcoholism. At least that's how I felt. I just wanted to get me sober. And then after I had been sober a little while, I started caring about some of the other people in my group. And eventually I started caring a little bit about my group and then about AA in my community. But it took a while for that to spread out. Now, um, I look at, at George, this fellow, as kind of an Eskimo in my life because he got it set up so that I'd be elected GSR of my group because nobody wanted to be the GSR in that group. And he said, that'll be a good thing for you because it'll get you a commitment to AA. And uh, But he said, it'll be low key, low surface. And he was right. Nobody in my group ever wanted to hear any reports. <laughs> they never wanted to know what was going on any place. And um, and I hated the district meetings. God, I, I uh, just almost thought they were a fate worse than death. And I'd go to those meetings, and it seemed to me all anybody wanted to do was argue about who would bring what to the potluck at the next area assembly. And uh, it, it really took a while for me to realize that these people, I did, though, incidentally note that they had all been sober and were staying sober, but it took me a while to realize that, that, and I, I don't want to get into a long service talk, and I promise you I'm not going to, but it, this was important for me. I realized a lot of us in my group griped a lot about what was going on in AA. This is back in the 70s, and we thought there should be a paperback big book, and, and in San Francisco we thought gay groups should be listed in the directory, and we had a lot of ideas and opinions about things. But, you know, if we didn't have what I was, which was the GSR, going to the district meetings, going to the assemblies, and expressing our group conscience to those people who would, to the delegate who would then go to New York and express our group conscience, we really didn't have a right to gripe about it because uh, we weren't taking part. Without that, we were a little island out here by ourselves. So... I did get active, and I I, uh, I learned a lot of things, and it had a lot to do with my spiritual and emotional growth because I, I realized that you can disagree with people and not be too disagreeable in the way you do it. Uh, I, I learned to get along with a lot of different types. You know, I, I think a lot of the reason I got drunk was <coughs> lack of steps, lack of spiritual growth, and also too much of a tendency for me to just stay with exactly the same people all the time and not grow. And I did develop what I think of as a very spiritual program for me. It works for me and a faith in a God that sometimes I don't understand. And, and I'd like to talk about that a little bit, too. I, You know, but in thinking about this talk, I thought of a million things I would like to share, and then I would go blank. <laughs> And now it's just all all happening. But um, I I ended up becoming very active in Northern California coastal area of AA, which is what led to, to going to New York and, and getting back to Eskimos in my life, which I think I'm going to manage to tie into this in a very convoluted way. 
when I was brand new, and I mean four days dry in 1970, I decided that uh, I would go home for Christmas. I had already planned that before I joined AA to visit my alcoholic mother and also to visit my grandmother who lived in Denver. I was just very, very close to her and had, had made those plans. And people in AA in San Francisco said, you just can't go to Denver four days dry and stay sober with an alcoholic mother. And I went anyway. Um, and I remember at the airport... And I always had drinks at the airport before flying, looking around in the waiting area, and it was the plane was packed, of course, and I thought, gee, there must be 300 people on this plane. And statistically, there must be another alcoholic out of 300 people. And statistically, I'll bet there's even another AA member on this plane, and I sure wish I knew who it was so I could talk to them right now. Now, this is four days dry, and I always had at least two drinks flying from San Francisco to Denver after the drinks at the airport. So I got on the plane, and the flight attendant came down with the bar cart, and I held on to the seat and grimly ordered a 7-Up and then bored the poor guy to death, telling him, that the guy next to me, that I was in AA and didn't drink anymore, and he really cared a lot. <laughs> and uh, And when I got to Denver... I looked up AA in the phone book, and there was an intergroup office, a central office that could give me some information, a service available, and I found out that there was a club in Denver called the York Street Club in a kind of crummy part of town, but they had meetings seven nights a week. So I went out the next night to a meeting, and in walked the flight attendant who had been pushing the bar cart. And she had been sober a month at the time, and she's still sober. So I think of that flight attendant as a, an Eskimo in my life because uh, that told me, the message in that was that there are AAs everywhere. I just might not know who they are at the time. And that on that trip, incidentally, I um, took a cab home because Mother was too drunk to meet me, and I walked into the house, and she was sitting there in a filthy, dirty robe, and her first words were, welcome home, honey. There's, there's um, beer and wine in the refrigerator and vodka in the cabinet. And I looked at her. Now, I still hadn't made a real commitment. And I said, Mom, I've been going to AA lately. I think I'm an alcoholic. And she couldn't even focus on me. But she said, oh, honey, you're no more alcoholic than I am. <laughs> and, and I looked at her. And she's an Eskimo in my life because that was a real message to me. So I, uh, as I said, have a lot of Eskimos in my life. And, and when I was invited to go to New York to work at the office, well, invited to come back and talk to them about working at the office, I had a lot of misgivings about it. I didn't want to leave San Francisco. I owned a house there. I had been in education for a lot of years, had a lot of AA friends. And I flew back during spring vacation and, uh, in 1977 and arrived on a Sunday afternoon. And, and I just kind of thought, well, I have the whole afternoon and evening free. I'll just turn it over and see what develops. And I did call the New York Intergroup and found out where a meeting was so I'd have some sort of destination for the evening. And I set out. And I didn't know anything about New York, and I had only met two people from the office, and I couldn't really call them friends. They were acquaintances. I barely knew them. And I found myself by a subway station, and I thought, well, I'll take the subway to Greenwich Village. Somehow it was a gorgeous, sunny April day, and I thought it would be nice to walk in the art shops and and see the coffee houses and all that kind of thing. And I got down there, and I started getting so negative and so uptight and so fearful about being in this great, big, overwhelming city where I didn't know a soul that I wasn't noticing beautiful architecture or colorful characters or anything like that. I was seeing grimy buildings and filth on the street and a lot of uh, just masses of people. And I started going into withdrawal because I hadn't had a cup of coffee since the plane. And I saw a little coffee house with plants hanging in the window, and I went in. I sat down by myself, 
And everybody in there was with a real good friend, you know, deep in conversation. And I thought, these are the kind of friends you have when you've lived someplace 10 or 20 years. And I'll never have friends like that if I move here at the age of 40. And three guys sat down at the table next to me. And I was really thinking, seriously thinking about going back out to Kennedy, flying back to San Francisco, calling the office the next morning and saying it was a terrible mistake. I just couldn't make a move like that. And these three guys started talking, and I overheard two fellows talking to the one saying things like, how long since your last drink? Have you got a sponsor? Have you found a home group? (laughs) And I couldn't believe my ears, and I introduced myself, and they said, well, this is the AA hangout of Greenwich Village. And all these people just left the Sunday afternoon Perry Street workshop. (laughs) So... So those were Eskimos, too. Uh, You know, I thought, well, you know, I can go anywhere in the world as long as there's an AA group because I have built-in family, built-in friends. So I started working at GSO, and I can't tell you that working there makes every day a spiritual experience uh, by a long shot. (laughs) There are more than 80 employees at GSO. There are 10 of us on the staff. All staff members are AA members. The people in records and files and the shipping department and the mailroom are, are, I'm not going to say not alcoholics because we don't know that, but they're not AA members. And the general manager is a member of AA, is a member of AA. So um, I was telling somebody from Levittown, New York last night, that my first call, I, I got there in 77, a woman named Cora Louise was then the staff coordinator and a beautiful lady, and she is my mentor as far as GSO is concerned, and she was training me, and the phone rang, and she said, now pick up the phone, dear, that's your first call, so I picked it up, and I expected a nice, loving AA voice at the other end, and instead, this fellow from Leviton said, you blankety-blank people have done it again, and he was all hot under the collar about something in the AA group pamphlet. I think the fact that open meetings were described as meetings where anyone interested could attend, and he thought it was all my fault that that was in there, and I had been working there about an hour and a half at the time. And so, as I said, it's not all a spiritual experience there. And and I also just want to say quickly, just interject, that believe me, the ten of us who work there on the staff are not the ultimate authority, and we just cannot make decisions about what's in pamphlets and what's not in pamphlets and who should be doing what in AA. And that honestly is a decision made by you people, but it's only made by you people if you have a GSR who goes to district meetings and and area meetings and elects a delegate who goes to New York to be your voice. And if you don't do that, then then, uh, that's really your problem, not mine. Um, uh, My first assignment at GSO was literature, and it was exciting, and we made a film for, for use outside AA, and that was really big stuff for somebody who had been a fourth or fifth grade teacher all her life. My next assignment was cooperation with the professional community. You see, we rotate every two years there. As soon as we start to know what we're doing, they change us. (laughs) And and that was fun because I went to a lot of alcoholism conferences and met a lot of people in the field and, and learned a lot about that kind of thing. And then I got an assignment that seemed like it was going to be kind of low key after these big jobs I had had, and it was the loners assignment, loners and internationalists. And I, in all honesty, was not thrilled over the idea of two years of mostly writing letters without any big projects to get my teeth into. And those two years of writing to AA members who live in remote, isolated places where there are no meetings to go to, where their connection with AA is through literature, through writing letters, through tapes, uh, did more for my spiritual growth than I think anything I've ever been involved with. There are about 600 people in, I don't know, 90 or so countries around the world who some of them have never even been to a meeting other than the monthly meeting, I mean the uh, bi-monthly meeting by mail that we send that, that you people make possible. 
Um, and it was while I was on the loner's assignment that I got involved in something that, that became, I don't know, a very spiritual and emotional experience for me. We um, got a letter last May from, um, and I'm going to share this <coughs> because I really think the letter was to you as much as it was to anybody at the office. It was a letter from a Marine who was in Beirut, and he started off the letter, To Whom It May Concern. It was a very business-like letter. Please send me resources and literature catalog <coughs> for a group I'm starting here. And he said, and please also send information about procuring tapes. I don't think we're going to have too many speakers at our meeting. And uh, he signed it, you know, sincerely yours, John O. Lance Corporal, and so forth. And Phyllis Masbach was on the overseas assignment, one staff person responsible for all mail from overseas. And she wrote back, you know, a Dear Johnny kind of letter and said we were glad to hear from him and, and sure we'd send the literature catalog and information about where they can get tapes of AA talks and and we're delighted to hear he's starting a group. You know, it was just a nice, warm, friendly letter. And again, that kind of service is made possible because you people support it. And so the next letter from Johnny was a Dear Phyllis letter. And he said, you know, really, at this point, I don't know that I could really call it a group. There's just two of us. And he said, I was sober a year and two months before coming to Beirut. And I'm a member of the Jacksonville group in Jacksonville, North Carolina. And he said, the other member of the group isn't really sure he wants to be a member of the group. <laughs> and he's still drinking from time to time. And he said, and I've only done my steps one through five. But who says you have to do all 12 steps to try to carry the message to a fellow sufferer? And he said, you know, I'd really be ashamed to see him go down the tubes. And uh, so we responded and, of course, sent uh, Johnny literature. And, and then the next letter was Dear Phyllis and Friends. <laughs> and some, his letters were real cute. And he was really hanging in. And, and he had taken every book and booklet that we publish over there with him and said he kept them with him all the time and and he signed that when baffled in Beirut and and I got involved because Phyllis fell off her bicycle the 4th of July and broke her hip and was out of the office for a while so I was doing the overseas assignment along with my loners and I asked Johnny if he wanted to be a loner but no he, he wasn't going to be a loner he was really going to get a group started and he was determined to do that and then you know these Eskimos do keep popping up about that time, and now we're into July, a uh, letter came into the office from a civilian student in Beirut, a Lebanese woman, and she said she was not an alcoholic, but she was interested in more information about uh, alcoholism and starting AA in Beirut. She was very concerned about the problem in her country. And about three days after we got that letter, a minister from Beirut, another Lebanese who had been studying in the States, came to the office and he said he had been here a year and had heard a lot about AA in that year because of PI, public information activities and so forth, and wanted information to take back to his country. So we told him about Johnny and this group that he was trying to start at the uh, airport where the Marines were garrisoned. And, you know, arranged it so that the three of them could get together. And the student and the minister ran some announcements in the newspaper in Beirut saying that AA is now available if you have a drinking problem. Some very, very well-prepared informational articles about AA. They were not promotional. No anonymity was broken. It was strictly within the tradition because of the information they had gotten and because of Johnny's experience with AA. So the group did start meeting, and Johnny was better than a lot of people in this country about sending us precise information. The group met in the headquarters by the airstrip regularly at Sundays at 4.30, and he was the group contact, and uh, they had eight members at this point. Uh, the, the student in Beirut turned out to be more alcoholic than she had led us to believe, and she was the beginner. And um, and Johnny said, you know, that other Marines had popped up 
as members of AA out of those 1,600. And he said, sometimes our meetings are interrupted by shelling, so I don't know if the women from Beirut are going to keep coming back. And, and he said, you know, we're not drinking, though. And he said, we're just busy trying to stay alive one day at a time. And he said, you know, most of the time there were about four of them at their meetings because the other four would be on the on the front line or in their whatever. Well, the last letter we got from Johnny was in September. And he said the group was now going strong. They named it the Peacekeeping Group. And he said, we're just sure that when we go home in November, the fellows who replace us, there'll be some members, so the group will continue. And he signed that letter beginning in Beirut. And, you know, before I came to AAA, sometimes I couldn't even cry when I thought it was appropriate to do it. Um, his name was on the list casually, so, so Johnny's not coming home. Um, I'm sorry. I think I had some kind of mother-son connection. Not everybody who writes to GSO gets this kind of emotional attention. <laughs> um, anyway, I think someday we're going to open the international directory and see several groups in Beirut. And in my mind, Johnny... Olson will always be the founder of AA there. But um, it is a spiritual experience to work at GSO, one that I'm very grateful to have. And I invite all of you to come visit us. If ever you're in New York, the office is on, in the low rent section of Park Avenue South uh, between 31st and 32nd Street. And, and we have about 2,000 visitors a year there, and I hope you'll be one of them this year. We have meetings every Friday at 11 o'clock, and you're always welcome, uh, a regular AA meeting. And um, it's just been a wonderful privilege to be here and share with you this morning. Thank you. I love you all. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.